Here today to speak about serialized content is Molly Barton, the co-founder of Serial Box, which was deemed the HBO of reading by National Public Radio. Molly was previously the global digital director at Penguin Random House, where she led the global ebook business, digital project innovation, and content strategy. Prior to that, she founded Book Country, a writer collaboration and self-publishing platform. So please welcome to Tech Forum, Molly Barton. Morning, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I flew up from New York this morning. It was incredibly easy on Porter Air. My first experience doing that. Um, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about the patterns that I saw when I was digital director at Penguin Random House and Penguin before that, um, that led to what I'm working on now. Uh, and a bit about what we've learned in our first year and change of doing business. Um, so just to give you a sense of my background a bit, um, I began in publishing an editorial. I was working on fiction uh, and narrative nonfiction. And uh, that was my plan. I was gonna be an editor, that was my goal. Um, but about a year after I started um, acquiring, uh, I, I switched into what I thought really was a business job and not at all what I expected to do. Um, but I kind of made a deal with the president um, of Penguin US that I could edit on nights and weekends while I was doing my day job with her, uh, which was really great. Mm. Because I kept the sort of perspective of an editor and kept the perspective of writers going through the publishing process while I was kind of getting my MBA on the job because I went to 22 financial meetings a month tracking the performance of all the different imprints in the US and seeing what was working and not working and collaborating with marketing and sales and um, even operations and production on various different initiatives to make the company more successful. Um, so a couple of the things that I worked on in those years um, were basically I was looking for opportunities um, to use digital more effectively, uh, to maximize like things that we saw that were working. Uh, and so I developed a program called Penguin Specials, which was like a precursor to Kindle singles, um, because we were tr looking for ways to engage the audience before a big book came out. Uh, one of the hardest things being uh, the length of time that usually occurs between books. Uh, where you know you've got a book three years ago uh, and try to, to remind uh, the fans of that author that something's coming out and they should prepare for it. Um, so we started releasing these novellas as prequels to um, big frontless fiction that we were publishing and that became quite a successful program and then Kindle singles launched and it became much easier to do. Um, and so that was kind of the work that I was doing was looking for for mechanisms for growth and then experimenting with them and then putting them back into uh, the company at large. Um, I also, as mentioned in the introduction, um, developed a startup within Penguin um, called Book Country and uh, lots of similarities to Wattpad, which you just heard a lot about. Um, and really the theory there was um, instead of sort of turning away from authors who were submitting their work to Penguin and being rejected, <clears throat> let's create a place for unpublished authors to collaborate and get feedback from each other uh, and improve their work uh, in the hopes that they can either self-publish successfully with a community of other writers and readers around them um, or go on to be published traditionally. Um, and so, uh, let's see. <clears throat> so Penguin Specials, Book Country, these various different initiatives um, where I was looking for ways to really grow uh, the business overall. At the time when I was in this role, um, it was the first moment in the industry where people were really experimenting with multimedia books, and like putting video in and putting audio and other things. And so I did some of that and I think we all sort of came to the conclusion that readers want to read <laughs> and that we shouldn't fancy up the product, that we should give them what they want. So. Um, I ended up feeling like ebooks weren't really um, making it easier for people to read. Sure, it's great to be able to carry um, hundreds of books with you, um, but actually getting through it is actually a bit difficult, more difficult with ebooks than with physical books. With a physical book, you've got it on your bedside table, 
you can kind of see how much you have left and plan your consumption a bit, like, oh, I've got that much, maybe I should take it with me on my weekend trip, or I can finish that on Wednesday night, I know I have a bit more time. And with ebooks, it's in some ways more um, uh, less knowable. And so I was thinking about that. I was watching what was going on um, with podcasts and the rise of podcasts and the popularity of episodic television. And so I kept thinking maybe if we break books into smaller parts and make them more approachable, we could reach a broader audience. And so that's when I started experimenting with serialization. <clears throat> and I took two authors um, at Penguin who we're selling between 25 and 30,000 copies a bo uh, per book, which is pretty good. You can have a pretty decent living if you uh, do that over and over again, depending on where you live. Um, and you can even hit the New York Times bestseller list, depending on the time of year. Mm. But they were ambitious and they wanted to grow, so I asked them to write novels that were structured to be read two chapters at a time. And so they wrote differently. They wrote these chapters with an arc that they expected the reader to read in one sitting. Uh, and we published them as conventional ebooks. We published those two chapters every Tuesday over the course of a number of weeks. And then at the end, we released the physical book. And the first author, we took up over 130,000 copies. And the second author, we took up to 90,000 copies. So I was like, this is interesting. <laughs> there is something here. Um, and so when I decided, I'd kind of been bitten by the entrepreneurial bug. I'd started Book Country. I'd sat on the board of other startups that Penguin and Pearson were invested in. I wanted to uh, build my own company and really try to create a growth mechanism for the industry because I wanted to be ambitious about audience. I felt like if Serial, the podcast, can attract 7 million listeners, surely you know we can design entertainment experiences that are appealing to millions of people. Um, so that's when I started Serial Box, and really what we're doing is blending <clears throat> traditional publishing, editorial development practices with television story development practices. So we bring um, writers together in a writer's room. Uh, we work with teams of four or five writers at a time, and we develop these serials that we release in weekly episodes that are 40 minutes to read or an hour to listen to. Uh, so while I was doing research on um, what I was going to do post-Penguin, I was looking into what's happening, and there were some promising trends that I'm sure you've all seen, but maybe worth taking a minute on, that young people are actually reading more and spending more on books than some older generations. So in 2015, 12 million millennials spent $60 on books. Uh, that surprised me. <laughs> you know, that's more than people in their 40s are spending per year. And the format is shifting. Um, as you heard Ashley talking about, mobile reading is so dominant now. 50% of digital reading is mobile, so e-readers are going away. Audiobooks are the fastest growing segment by far. Um, I would love to hear if anyone knows the, the percentage of audiobooks in the Canadian market. Uh, and then podcast listenership is going through the roof. It's like over 30% growth in the last 12 months. So these patterns uh, were good indicators to me that working um, with E and audio and targeting a younger audience was a good way to go. Again, back to the kind of point about ambition. I wanted to look beyond the readers and listeners that we were already um, serving in traditional publishing and uh, tap into some of these fans who maybe are reading a lot on Wattpad or reading tons of Medium articles but not necessarily reading books. And really, I spoke a bit about the new reality that I feel like we're all confronting, but these particular points are that books now feel daunting in length, the way that movies feel daunting in length. I keep hearing people say, you know, they're with friends, uh, and they're like, what should we watch? And somebody says, a movie, and everyone's like, no, it's like two hours. <laughs> you know, let's watch a show. Um, but in reality, with the show, you're committing to 13 hours. Um, and so it's this, it's this um, ease of entry uh, where you control um, the intervals. You know what the interval's going to be and you have this very pleasing experience of saying, yes, I want more of that. 
yes, I want more of that, uh, rather than it all being presented to you at once. Uh, and then people say, well, what about short fiction? Shouldn't you just read a New Yorker article or something else? Um, but I, my feeling with fiction, and I'm, I'm really focused on fiction, um, is that it takes some effort as a reader to get into the voice of the author. And that's the same, whether it's a novel length work or um, a short story. And then as soon as the short story's over, you don't get to have the relationship with the characters that you kind of invested in. Um, and then, Serial, one thing that's so much fun about serial television is you can meet up with a coworker or a friend or your aunt and say, did you see episode three? You know like exactly where to begin the conversation. So it's highly social uh, in a way that novels are a bit harder to access. Obviously book clubs are wonderful, um, but it takes a bit more effort and work to get to some point of connection. And then there's the age old question of what's worth my time. There's so many books, um, how can I choose? And so here, with C what we're trying to do with Serial Box, really our ambition, and we're so happy when um, NPR called us the HBO for reading because that's really our ambition is to create this brand that people trust and so they feel like, okay, I'll try this because it's a Serial Box series. <clears throat> so, as I said, what we do is uh, produce fiction series that read and listen like uh, watching a TV show. Uh, the episodes are 40 minutes to read or an hour to listen to. And as you can see in the app image, um, the headphones and the little reading symbol, you can toggle back and forth while you're reading um, to listening. Like if you're on the train on your way to work and then you get off and you want to keep going, you can switch over to audio. Really the point being, we want to make it possible for people to fit fiction into their lives. So many people say, uh, I just don't have time to read anymore, but I really want to. Um, and so making it uh, very flexible in terms of format is part of how we're uh, addressing that. <clears throat> also, our first episode of every series is free, so you can try it and see if you like it. Um, I, we already talked about how social it is, and then flexibility with audio. Um, and back to that point about the early experiment I did when I was at Penguin with the two authors. Um, we're not taking books and chopping them into parts. We're really conceiving of the story the way that a TV season is conceived of, like looking at the whole arc and then designing episode arcs within that. So each episode stands on its own. You can happily read one and have a satisfying experience um, though you will see the, the beginning of the season-long arcs there, too. Um, so why are we doing this? Um, back to my 22 financial meetings a month, one of the most obvious patterns um, across imprints, regardless, actually, whether you're publishing fiction, nonfiction, what have you, every time an author publishes a second book, the first book sells. Every time they publish a third book, the first and second book sell. Um, it may not be huge numbers, but you always see that bump. And so to me, serial, serialization takes that uh, rule to its extreme. And we do publish, we're not sort of giving up on the book, we do publish physical books um, at the end of this. Uh, right when we started Serial Box a little more than a year ago, Simon & Schuster in New York came to us and said, this is so interesting, can we print you know, physical copies? So they bought rights to the first three serials that we had available and uh, published a simultaneous hardcover and paperback uh, about three weeks ago, four weeks ago now, uh, of Book Burners, our first series. And we really feel like uh, the serial release in digital and audio before the physical book release is marketing for that binge experience at the end. So we go back and tap into the readers who were fans through the digital and audio release and promote um, the physical book. They may not buy it again, but their social media chatter, their enthusiasm for it will hopefully cause their friends to buy it. Um, another bit that's interesting about publishing serially and the speed with which we publish, it takes us, um, we can go as quickly as six months like from idea to publication, um, but we don't have everything sort of locked in when we start releasing the first episode, because as you can imagine, with 13 episodes, it takes us about three months, um, because we release every Wednesday. Uh, so when we release the first one, the last few episodes aren't 
totally finished, which is great because we can watch what's happening with readers, what they're reacting to, what they're saying on social media, uh, because each series that we produce, we plan for multiple seasons. So we want to see what's happening so we can kind of steer the story depending on the reader response. Um, and of course, because they're reading in our app and on our website, in addition to out on Amazon, Apple, Google, uh, we know who the readers are, we know how quickly they're reading, when they're switching over to audio, etc. The other interesting thing about being able to move so quickly from writing to publication is that we can kind of echo what's happening in the world, which right now is pretty dramatic all the time. Um, so the storylines feel very current. I mean, this is right back to Dickens, where when he was writing stories, if a new pub opened, the new pub went right in the story. So we, we have that kind of currency in fiction, which um, I think is unusual, um, perhaps not on Wattpad. Um, then, so this is a bit more about how we do this. Um, we put together these teams of writers. One of the writers is the lead writer uh, in TV parlance. That would be the showrunner in some ways. Um, and we bring them together in person for a few days. And based on my editorial experience working with authors like Nick Hornby, Terry McMillan, sort of um, upmarket commercial fiction, and my partner's experience, uh, he spent about six months researching TV development and working with a bunch of TV writers. And my husband's also a TV producer. So we kind of cooked up this process based on our shared experiences uh, where we uh, plot out the season, spend a ton of time on character development. A lot of people ask me, well, how can you ensure quality when you've got different writers writing the different episodes? Um, and there are a couple of different ways that we approach that. Um, one is the lead writer does kind of um, write over um, all of the writers in the room, and um, but but we really focus on character development because if you've seen a show where you've got a guest TV show where you've got a guest director, um, the characters still feel like themselves. You might feel the kind of stylistic influence of the director, um, but the characters still feel true. And so that's really what we focus on. There may be slight tonal um, differences or stylistic differences between the, the writers. <clears throat> but all the writers read each other's episodes. It's extremely collaborative, um, not just in person, but on Slack and um, Google Hangouts, things like that. Um, and when we move into later seasons, we bring uh, reader and listener feedback into the room. So we, comp oops, excuse we compile different things that authors uh, that readers have said about the characters, and that goes into the creative process. We're not just listening to exactly what the fans want, but certainly factoring in their uh, responses. So these are the serials that we've released um, to date. We're focusing on science fiction fantasy, mystery thriller, crime, and a little bit of romance and women's fiction. I'm actually um, producing Geek Actually and False Idols right now. Those are our next two releases. Um, so I think that I will open it up to questions, because uh, I would love to hear what you have to say. Um, we just went to London Book Fair and talked to a lot of um, foreign language publishers about the model, and um, so enthusiastic for feedback and questions. Yes, the question, I don't know if you could hear, uh, was are we doing the publishing and the audiobook all at the same time? Yeah, so we have the writer's room writing, um, then we have developmental editing, uh, proofreading, copy editing, uh, and then we also record. We work with independent audio producers. Yeah. Hi, um, really interesting model. Thanks for sharing it with us. Um, I was just curious if you Sounds like there's a lot of, with the Google Hangouts and all of that, there's maybe reasons why you decided to work with the writer's room. But I was just curious if you could talk a bit more about whether you think the model could be used with a single author or there's a reason why you didn't go with just, you know, maybe having that same serialization process, but with one author. Certainly, uh, and we're certainly up for working with an individual author. Part of the reason that we're working with a team 
um, is speed, because when I was at Penguin and going to all those financial meetings, I did other things too, besides going to financial meetings, but um, they were very present. Um, so uh, Putnam, for example, the imprint, uh, was trying to move 25% of the writers on their list to multiple books per year, um, because that was the biggest mechanism for growth that they could see was frequency. Um, not every writer, most writers, can't keep up with that schedule writing two to three novels a year. Some of them are writing in teams there, or you've got like the father-son teams in the crime world. Um, but most writers can't keep up with that. So the idea here is we can move very quickly to produce the first season, and then if it starts to work and we see the audience really coming to it, we can develop the second season really quickly and not lose that momentum. So that's the main reason. Uh, great question. Could everyone hear it? Yeah, okay. Um, we find our writers through um, agents, through existing relationships that, that I had, um, and actually that my, my partner had. He's not from the publishing world at all. He's a lawyer by trade, um, but he happens to have a lot of fans in the sci-fi fantasy world, so brought some writers from that social world. Um, and then we also work with talent managers in LA. We work with a couple of TV writers. Um, and we pay them uh, in a very traditional way. They get an advance per episode, a royalty per episode. And then uh, we give a piece of the back end if we adapt for film and television, which is also very much the, the purpose of serialization. Yeah. Uh, I think you just answered my question. So you're so close to a television model and creating that. Is that of your plan to yes yeah um, when I was a uh, digital director I hired a great um, guy from DC Comics to come back to New York and run digital product development with me and he said to me you know 20 to 25 percent of the list at DC every year gets um, published not because they think it's going to be a best-selling comic but because they want to send it to producers for television adaptation and just showing it in the form, uh, it's much easier to get, uh, get the attention. So that's not exactly what we're doing, but we're certainly um, a few steps ahead in terms of uh, likelihood of adaptation because we've already structured the content to be uh, viewed episodically. Um, so we've gotten great inbound inquiry from studios. We're packaging our first project uh, with UTA and so more to come on that. I think I neglected to tell you the most basic thing about the business, which is it's $1.59 a week um, for each episode, or you can buy the whole thing up front. So it's, a, it's per serial. It's not two serial box. So it's kind of like buying a show on iTunes. Um, we were surprised because we were aware, very aware of the prices of eBooks, and we felt like with 13 episodes, um, you know, that's, maybe people would have sticker shock, so that's why we were charging week by week. We also liked the idea of them coming back and coming back season after season. Um, but within a couple months of launching, um, a lot of readers uh, asked if we would offer the ability to buy up front. So now people, about half of our audience is buying um, at about $20 a season up front, and then other people are paying $1.59 a week. And as I said, referenced, uh, we do distribute out to Apple and Amazon and Audible, those places. Yeah. And what do you guys Both. Both. Um, the question was, what does the print form look like? Um, and so Simon & Schuster published Book Burners as a simultaneous hardcover and paperback run. Um, it's quite a fat book. Uh, which is okay because it's sci-fi fantasy. I think in the future for other categories we may go a little bit shorter because each episode right now is about 12,000 words. So that gets right up there. Um, so some of the seasons that we have in development are 10 episodes rather than, so that conversion to the final book form um, is, requires less adaptation. Um, but we're, I was surprised the hardcover uh, is in its second print run. I thought the paperback would go, but um, yeah. yeah. Right, <laughs> collector's item. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just looking at my next question. But um, have you seen any preference to um, uh, consumptive behavior or screening behavior in the audience? 
Great question, whether there's a pattern between listening, reading, et cetera. Um, there's a core of people who, uh, it's about 45% who read and listen, and then sections on either side who are only readers, only listeners. Yeah. And did you have a question? Mm -hmm. We're young and we don't have, you know, dozens and dozens of series, and so we felt that uh, allowing people to choose uh, and pay per serial uh, made more sense. And happily, I mean, almost 70% of our audience buys content in more than one serial, so uh, for right now it makes much more sense for us to leave it that way. I think it would be quite, quite some time before we would shift to a um, service for you know service fee for the whole platform, um, and th I should say you know in our first year the the sort of three questions that we wanted to answer were, can we create really great fiction this way with teams of authors and and working so quickly, um, and we've gotten really great feedback from readers directly, but we also just got a great review in the New York Times, and then really authoritative blogs like io9 and tor.com have loved what we're doing, so we feel like we've Tick that box, which is great. Um, and then the second one was, would people pay and would they keep coming back? Um, and we are really happy to see that uh, our conversion rate from the first free episode to the first paid episode is in the high teens, so like 17 or 18 percent of people who read the free one start paying. And then once people start paying, it's almost 90 percent retention. It's like 89 percent retention on average to the end of the season. So we feel Really happy about that. And then the last question was, you know, it's very difficult to get people to a new website or a new app. Um, could we market and get people to the platform affordably? Um, and we're seeing that we're able to get people to the platform for between, paying users to the platform for between three and six dollars, depending on the marketing channel. Uh, and on average, they buy, so far, 21 episodes from us. So. The return on the investment is quite rapid, just a few weeks' time. Um, so we're now we're just really uh, bearing down on, on marketing and producing more content. Any more questions? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, Kat. Sure. Um, we are, <clears throat> we've been bootstrapping primarily. Um, we got a little bit, we did a small family and friends round to start. Um, and now that we've answered those three kind of proof points, we're in talks uh, to raise our seed round. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.